Morning all, I have a very interesting game to show you from the Capel Le Grand tournament. A player called Eric Hansen, who I've witnessed on Chess Cube in the past. Phenomenal blitz player, absolutely phenomenal. And uh, even stronger than the mighty Telos, Aman Hamilton, um, uh, who, th these, these Canadian players are very, very promising. But Eric is doing very well in tournaments at the moment. And in the 29th Capel Le Grand, let's see his game against Yuri Vok. Vok, 2594, a very strong grandmaster. He plays white, he plays e4, and interestingly, the first few moves match my last over the board game. Bishop b5, and his opponent even plays e6, and this knight g e7. And in my game, I played c3, but. Okay, let's see what happened in this game. We see rook e1 instead. This looks like a very, very interesting alternative. The c3 and d4 plan might not be as effective as playing for d4. Let's see. Black played a6. And now it would seem, is white going to just return the bishop humbly and then carry on in Roy Lopez fashion maybe later with c3 and d4? Well, actually, we see bishop takes c6 being played. And you might think this is a little bit strange, absurd, giving up the light square bishop. But as we often know, when you give up the bishop of a certain color for a knight, you're often, often damaging the opponent's control on the opposite color com complex. So here the dark squares potentially are more strangled uh, by white, more gripped by white, the dark squares, after this particular transaction. Uh, for example, if you play bishop g5 takes f6, you're often weakening light squares. So if you play this, you're often weakening dark squares. But, okay, at the moment, it's not so clear. Knight takes c6. We see d4. White's not even bothering with c3. Very fast, opening up the game here. Does white really have anything, though? Hasn't white just given up the bishop pair? Well, black has to deal with d5 here, and d5 looks very uncomfortable for ed with that rook on e1. So black takes on d4, knight takes d4. Okay, and in this position we also can see that black is without that defensive knight. So perhaps later this is going to be an issue for a direct attack. Black in this position played b6. And now white took on c6, d takes c6. But the idea wasn't to get an end game here with queen takes d8, check. Knight d2 is played. This keeps the queens on and potential issues for black. Bishop e7, queen g4. Queen is an attacking piece here. Black castles defending g7 like that. And now we see e5. So this dark square grip is evident now this knight is ready to spring in to one of these dark squares. And that looks quite annoying. So we see that when we give up a bishop for a knight, sometimes we do get latent pressure on that color complex. Here the dark squares, there seems to be a grip, which was very difficult to perceive earlier. Now black tries to release that grip he doesn't want this uncomfortable looking knight e4 played against him. He plays f5. Now f5 subtly weakens black's king's position here. White takes, leaving black also with an isolated pawn. Rook takes f6. And now knight f3. That pawn looks like a real, real target here of attack. Now black dares to transform this position into some kind of gambit. Plays e5, attacking the queen. The queen goes to e4, putting a lot of pressure on that pawn. That pawn's dropping off soon, surely. Here, okay, it's offered. Bishop f5. Queen takes e5, attacking the bishop. No time for bishop c2. The bishop attacks the queen. Is this a ferocious gambit position or something? The queen drops back to c3 here. Eyeing c6, potentially at the moment, of course, bishop h2 is possible. Queen c7, 
and then we see bishop g5, the rook moves, and now bishop h4 as if just calmly to get rid of the dark squared bishop. So white is a solid pawn up here. Black plays bishop g4, and now we see a really, really impressive move in this position. I wonder if you can spot it if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, white plays knight g5, offering h2 with check. So what on earth does knight g5 do? You might wonder. Well, one thing is, if the rook dares to move off f7 in this position, then there's always things like queen c4 check, double attacking on that loose piece here. This is a loose piece on g4. Black does take on h2, king h1, but what can black play now? He plays rook f4, guarding against queen c4 check, but then considers his position hopeless and actually resigns with this move on move 21. A 2594 resigning on move 21 with his move. Various moves actually win here, even taking this bishop is possible. Let's engine check this position. So g3, queen d3, queen b3, even king takes h2 is possible here. If king takes h2, what has black got? If he plays discover check, bishop g3, there's nothing here. On h6, bishop g3, is strong if takes here, leaving that horrible pin. Rook e4. This is much better for white still. Very very strong position. Plus three. So in this position, though, the most clinical apparently, the most clinical move is g3, attacking the rook and keeping that bishop trapped. So if rook takes here, we have that check, that killer check on that loose bishop over here, for example, like this. An impressive game, and what I find mysterious about chess is that you, you play sometimes these, these openings, but um, there are really uh, venomous alternative ideas. So if we go back and check that, that opening, uh, Really, the idea of this bishop b5 uh, was of it were really uh, shown up here that white has a powerful move in rook e1. We'd done the reference check just a few days ago of this position, but rook e1, if we do a reference check here, rook e1, okay, that is the top one of the top used moves instead of c3, 1479, 14.26. So 1479 for rook e1. So black played a6, losing a little bit of time. That's the most popular move in this position. Knight d4, 168 games, but a6, over a thousand games. Rajabov, Shirov, Ivanchuk. They've all played this. So white taking on c6. And this, as I say, ignites a dark square strategy. When you give up the light square by, like this, you can logically think about the dark squares. Bishop for knight here. It's actually 410 games. The most popular is actually retreating bishop to f1, 705 games. But Ivanchuk has played this move before, one of the top exponents. If we look at the Ivanchuk game, also Tau against Bern in 1971 has this position. Let's have a look at the Tau game, Alakai Memorial. You see this dark square grip, e5. The dark squares are really under this kind of stranglehold, starting from that bishop b5. It's one of the um, amazing things about chess that uh, such a simple exchange can lead to such a grip, exchanging on c6. I guess we should also consider the Nimzo engine when black gives up the bishop in the Nimzo engine. 
gets a good grip on the light squares, like E4. So the principle has always been there if you look at examples of the idea of giving up bishop for knight. But here, look at this. This dark square grip really persists in this towel game as an example. And again, in the, even in this towel game, that e pawn on a light square is a bit of a target. A bit of a miserable target. White was winning material here after f4. And soon towel won this game. So this strategy is really uh, like a, I, I guess we can call it reverse Nimzo Indian uh, strategy. Pardon me. Um, so, knight takes c6. So, the top player here, Ivanchuk, if I can find the game, uh, played d4. Well, this follows our game path. So, c takes, knight takes. Okay. So in this position, we see b6. So is this an unusual move, b6 in this position? No games found. So a little bit of an innovation in this position. Uh, d6, 140 games. Queen c7, 90. Bishop e7, 53. If we go back, where did the Ivanchuk game uh, vary out of interest? So Ivanchuk had played d4. Knight takes d4. Too difficult to find, I'm afraid. Okay, so let's go back. In our main game, we saw b6, a little bit of an innovation, a prepared innovation. Not in the reference track at all. I can't find any games with this move. It seems to be inviting what what the engine thinks is a favourable exchange of queens uh, to be 0.51, but perhaps wisely White uh, declined this invitation and played the much more interesting knight d2 move, much more impassioned to keep the queens on. Uh, so knight d2 is not even it's not mentioned by the engine point of view, but it seems entirely logical that if White's going to play e5, knight e4 will be a beautiful place for the knight. So knight d2, maybe to the surprise of of Yuri Vok. Uh, so we see bishop e7, where it has that slight edge. Queen g4, black castles, and then this e5 move. And we see that giving up the bishop there, we have this latent dark square grip. White is threatening, for example, knight c4, or knight f3, knight c4, might follow by bishop e3. Some lines here, bishop e3 on b6, for example. So this breaking this bind on the dark squares cost black structurally this weakened e pawn. And now this the queen maneuvers are quite elegant here to get back to c3. That's a really really dangerous queen on c3 here. So white is better here, but facing a kind of gambit situation, black gambiting for some pressure, but white really consolidates powerfully. So this bishop h4 is a top, one of the top engine moves here. Just It seems very, very logical to get rid of that dark square bishop of blacks. And here, this, this is a really, really crushing move in this position. Knight g5. This is actually a loose piece. So the idea to attack h2 is powerfully refuted. Even though black set up, this is his whole idea of the gambit was this position to expose vulnerability of h2, but it's actually black. Black's king is in real trouble with this loose piece trying to do that. This loose piece on g4 is now a major liability. Huge advantage for white. It's blown. The game is actually ended here, in effect, after knight g5. What can black do? If he, if he gives up the exchange, that doesn't look too appetizing. So say rook a f8. We can just take here. Queen d4 again, double attack on, on both uh, pieces here. Bishop e7, get rid of the dark square bishop. Very unpleasant exchange down for not much. Not much is going on here, easily parried. 
And then white can continue in this position with all sorts, like rook d1. So this knight g5 is, is, is a game ender on move 20, basically. After bishop takes h2, black is in dire trouble in this position. He tried the top engine move, rook f4, but resigned with his move. So the most crushing move here is g3. So this kind of idea of, of exchanging off the bishop for knight is, is really, really vividly shown in this game, because it doesn't seem apparent that um, there's too much latent pressure here. If we look at this, bishop takes c6. It's letting black not even have the double pawns. The Nimza engine, when you play the Nimza engine, you're giving off the white double pawns, and you're getting control, more con more grip um, on the light squares as black when you play the Nimza engine. But here, the pressure on the dark squares is really impressively subtle, and is played on with the queens being maintained. And then later we saw that huge problem that it was black trying to get rid of the dark square grip that he ends up playing a concession move f5 which leads to this isolated e pawn and then to try and justify this gambit uh, we see this bishop g4 which is absolutely crushingly refuted with knight g5 comments or questions on youtube thanks very much